environmental zone restriction ahead. Make sure you have the required permit to proceed. What? Environmental what? zone restriction ahead. Make sure you have the required permit to proceed. I'm Mike. And I'm Danny. And this is Petrol Revolt. Welcome back to Petrol Revolt. In this episode, we're going to take the Aston V12 Zagato around the track. So what's your first impressions of this Aston then, Danny? Well, I mean, you know, obviously being British, you know, you know of Aston Martin, the brand, don't you? Because it's a massive British brand. But when I first see it, it doesn't look like the normal Aston Martin. It looks completely different. It's got an awesome style to it. That's obviously where I must have thought the Italian heritage comes into it because the Italians just do things right, don't they? You know, they just look, even, even when they, they're dress sense, they look cool, they make things look awesome. You can see that there's a little bit of an Italian hint to it, which is, which is really cool. To me, it looks like a James Bond car. I mean, it looks like someone cool could get out of it and, you know, just the whole, <laughs> the whole sort of, the way the car looks. But it's not been in any of the films, is it? No, this V12 Zagato was never a Bond car. Bond cars with a DB5 in Goldeneye. Then you've got Vanquish in Die Another Day. And then uh, most notably the DBS that rolled several times in Casino Royale. But this was never a Bond car. Well, it's a shame. I think they missed a trick there, didn't you? Because uh, mind you, they might need someone Italian to be in it just so they can put that little bit of suave onto it. So obviously we've said, you know, we know that it's got an Italian heritage to it and there's, a, there's a, an Italian touch to it. But how did all that come about and how is this car different to the other Aston Martins? Well, originally back in the day, this would have been Aston's sort of heyday back in the 60s. They had the DB4, which was their production car. Oh, it's a beautiful car. Uh, but they were trying to win races and Ferrari were their arch rival. Uh, apart from the DBR1, uh, which they had some success in Le Mans in 59, Aston were really struggling against Ferrari. And as you know, win on Sunday, sell on Monday, uh, Aston wanted to beat Ferrari on the racetrack. Uh, the DB4 was a bit heavy, a bit slow, so they gave a rolling chassis to the design house Zagato, who then made it lightweight, put a lightweight body on, beefed the engine up a little bit. And that was driven by Sterling Moss. And that was Aston's sort of like Le Mans race car of the era. So it's not, you know, like we, I've just spoke about it looking cool and stuff like that. It's not basically, they've not just got Italians to design it to make it look cool. They've put a lot of performance and uh, performance enhancing into it as well. Uh, Zagato was super serious about making lightweight sports car, which it, it sort of was, but it was still a bit, a little bit too heavy. Sterling Moss said it wasn't the greatest car around a track in interviews that I've seen him done. But what they did achieve, and as a byproduct, whether they meant this or not, is an absolute piece of art. Because the DB4 Zagato is like one of the most iconic and beautiful cars ever created. So we spoke about the DB4, and obviously this Zagato isn't a Bond car. So what was the purpose behind bringing the Zagato back? Well, the factory released this to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the DB4 Zagato. And they created two of these, they called them Zig and Zag, and they entered them into Nürburgring 24 hour race. To commemorate that activity, they then released a road car series, which this is one of. They did intend to sell something like 150 of them, but it was just after the 08 economic crash and it was quite hard to generate sales. So they only managed to sell 61. Uh, this is number 55 of 61. And it's quite special, this car, because of the 61, there's only about 10 that are right-hand drive. And this is the only one of 61 that was done in British Racing Green. 
It's got a real classic sandstone interior, British racing green. I mean, this is almost a special edition of a special edition. It's a, a super rare car. I mean, now, obviously, we have the Aston Martin F1 team, don't we? So, and they have got a similar, I don't think the colour's quite the same, but they have got a similar colour to this, haven't they, now? And it, I mean, it's nice to see the name back into the sport at a high level. But do you know how they got on in that 24-hour race? Of It was at Nürburgring, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, they're racing against some cars that are prepared by German teams specifically for Nürburgring, and it's unfair to... And they're never going to win. Uh, but in their class, they did very well. I think uh, one of the Zig or Zag finished second in its class. Uh, so the, the Astons, whether it's a V8 or the V12, do very well around Nürburgring because they're very durable. They're great endurance racers. They're good on fuel. And they had some good team drivers. So, you know, it's not like back in the days of Sterling Moss uh, and uh, well-known drivers, but, you know, they certainly did well. But the sort of problem for Aston is across the years in uh, WEC and other championships, they've done quite well, but they've never really translated that back into the dealership. So you don't see like an M-series range of cars in Aston's dealership. And like this Zagato, there are people within the Aston Martin world that know what Zagato is. But outside of the Aston world, people don't really know what Zagato is. I think that was a bit of a missed opportunity for them because... They started the Zagato uh, relationship in the 60s. And if every model would have had a Zagato special, then the Zagato brand for Aston would have been as well known as Alpina for BMW or maybe Singer for Porsche. But on the other side, it keeps it super rare, super exclusive. And if you know, you know. This car is very exclusive because of the color and stuff like that. But how much would one of these set me back? Well, these were sold in 2011 to about 13 and they were 330k plus the tax so they're pretty much 400k on the nose now because of their rarity you know this is rarer than a 177 they were only 61 made the 177 sold for 1.2 million pounds these have appreciated in value significantly since then so to get yourself behind the seat of one of these today especially this one being quite special right and drive British Racing Green. This is probably going to be worth, if it went to auction, 650k, 700k. I mean, it's well out of my price range, but can I blag myself for going it? Well, it's 510 horsepower. So are you sure you can handle that? <sighs> I mean, I'd love to give it a go. So before I start dreaming of trying to afford one of these cars, I love my classic cars. So how much would an original DB4 set me back? Oh, that, that is uh, that's dream territory. I mean, it is definitely dream territory. <laughs> this is dream territory for me, but you know, I just, I love them. So, you know, I'll, uh, yeah, I'd like to know what one of them would actually set me back. Well, the original DB4 Zagatos, Zagato officially made 19 of them. In 1960s, they sold for about five and a half thousand pounds. Now, depending on what calculator you use today, in today's money with inflation, they reckon that that is the equivalent of 150, maybe 175K today. But the last time a DB4 Zagato went to auction, it was somewhere in the region of 12 million. Oh, Jesus Christ. And that, so, so the, the DB4, they, that's the ones like, similar to the one Sterling Moss raced. Yeah, of that era, they yeah. made Sterling Moss's race car, uh, but they also made 19 chassis for the road. Yeah. And did they know at the time they were making the most iconic, beautiful car the world has ever seen? So we're surrounded by Astins here, and I know you used to work for Aston. So what is the design and the engineering behind this car? Well, this is a, a road car, one of 61. And actually, this is a completely standard V12 Vantage underneath the skin. It's just got lightweight carbon bodywork on. And uh, with the bespoke interior stitching that it's got, that's what turns it into the V12 Zagato. So it hasn't got um, a more powerful engine. It's not significantly lighter weight. For the zig and zag race cars, within the regulations that the Nürburgring Racing Formula allowed, Obviously, they're stripped back to race cars, so they were quite lightweight, and Aston probably did beef that motor up a bit. 
but apart from its carbon body and its interior stitching, this is actually based on a completely standard road car. So, like you said, obviously Aston for the Nurburgring 24 hour, they had to beef the engine up and stuff like that. But as we know with Aston Martins, they do build a, a robust engine. Um, and I know from my endurance racing, a lot of the time run a standard engine because we know that it's going to last. So you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I would think that Aston wouldn't have put too much more work into it because they knew that their engines in their car would at least last the race. Well, both the V8 and the V12 engines are really durable. Uh, they had to pass Ford's durability sign-off standards, which were super stringent. When I worked for Aston, I was performance development engineer, and we built the first V8 engine that went into the 2006 Nürburgring car. And that was just a blueprinted engine, so that was 380 horsepower that we did a little bit of porting on, increased compression ratio, uh, used some exotic internals to make it just that even more, a uh, little bit bulletproof. Uh, that was essentially a 420 horsepower engine that went round the 24 hour race. For these, and they're 510 horsepower to start with. They don't have to run the catalysts on the racetrack like they have to on the road. Uh, and with an uh, optimized engine ECU flash, they were probably punching out something like 550 horsepower, but that block, that engine block is so uh, meaty, it's, it's far too over-engineered, and that's why it's a little bit heavy. It, it could have uh, had some weight taken out of it and been a bit lighter, but it would have compromised durability. So, you know, this car could run 550 horsepower all day long, 24 hours, and, and after they've done one 24 hour race in it, they could do one the next day with the same engine. It, it wouldn't need any rebuilding. And obviously you said about the, the carbon bodywork and stuff like that on, on this car. Do you know roughly how much weight that saved, as, as a road car, how much weight that saved compared to a, a normal Aston Martin? Well, the standard V12 Vantage is around about 1700 kilograms, and they reckon that this weighs in at 1450. So that, carbon fiber bodywork weight reduction is actually quite significant. And although uh, the engine power and the chassis is identical to a standard road car V12 Vantage, when you drive this on the road, if you're in tune with the performance and acceleration of that standard car and drive this, you can actually feel the difference that that weight reduction makes. It just makes it feel like the engine wants to rev up a bit quicker because the vehicle weight is less. And on tipping and steering, it just feels a lot more agile. Yeah, I mean, I know with, with my racing, I've, I've, you feel a lot with the weight, you know, and we've tried carbon wheels at some point, and, and even that, you know, it's not, they're not a hell of, well, they are quite a bit lighter, but not, you're talking about a couple of hundred kilos. So it's a big, you're gonna feel that difference, aren't you? And especially when you start, okay, if you, when you're driving at 20, 30 mile an hour, you're not gonna know, but when you, you start, driving it a bit faster, you will feel that and it will, it will enhance the performance quite a bit, I should think. Yeah, it's all these little differences, as you know, that add up and make a, a bigger change uh, in total. I mean, in the road car world, uh, those front brakes uh, retail at seven grand plus the VAT and the rear brakes retail at six grand plus the VAT. If someone, not on the Zagato, but a standard road car, if someone didn't want to go to the expense of renewing the brakes, they look at a steel option. Because from the Aston range, you can retrofit a steel option. Uh, and we've done that for customers that didn't want to put the money into the carbons. I uh, wouldn't advise it, uh, but we've done it. And if you take that car for a drive and start to, to take some corners, and all of a sudden you realize that rotational inertia in that those steel brakes is significantly more than the carbons. And then you realize how much uh, benefit, not from braking, but from tipping and steering that you were getting from the carbons. Yeah, definitely. Well, like you say, it's all, uh, it's all moving parts, I suppose, as well, isn't it? So all them, all them, it being lighter weight and stuff like that, it all makes a, a big difference in a car, like the same it does on a bike. Yeah, I mean, there are some manufacturers that go to greater detail. Porsche is a great example. You know, they have a carbon fiber binnacle and, and they'll claim that it reduces a couple of hundred grams uh, in weight reduction. Aston are just nowhere near um, some other manufacturers. But the components that they do use, you know, this car at 1450 kilogram 
as a GT car with a heavy V12 engine that it's got, that's actually quite a good weight. You know, it's not like a Bentley, which is super heavy. And if you, as I've done, if you drive on these roads around here and Aston, uh, get the feel for how it turns in at the speed that you can take the corners at, and then say get a Continental GT in comparison to this, the weight of that Continental GT is going to want to throw you off the road, literally. Um, so, you know, Aston don't seek weight reduction to the lengths that Porsche do, but they're certainly not the, not the heaviest out there. I suppose that comes with everything, though. You know, you know, the lighter you go with things, sort of the more fragile they are as well. Um, and as we know, the Aston Martin is a very durable car, you know, so they're, they're obviously, they're, there's obviously a meaning behind it because you can go lighter with things and make things thinner and stuff like that, but then you do have more risk of them breaking. And as we know with Aston Martins and especially the engines, you know, they're, they're bulletproof. Well, uh, yeah, and, and it also, you start to lose refinement and this car, if you sit in it and go for a drive, is actually quite refined. Whereas you'll get some stripped out lightweight sports cars, you can hear stones pinging off wheel arch liners and inside the car, you just get uh, loud mechanical thrash type noises, wheel tire noises, wind noises, and they don't feel a refined place to sit. Yeah. So this is actually a really refined place to sit. But then you go up another level, you will have much more refinement, a heavier weight car like the Bentley. And as I found out when I was doing some calibration work for Bentley, you can sit inside most Bentleys and hear the C drive of your computer working. You can hear the, the, the disc, you can hear the computer workings. The Bentley is so, so quiet, but there's a penalty to pay for that. And it's uh, too much inertia uh, when you're out on the road and that will, reduce your speed and how quickly you can travel. The Aston has always been about a balance of all those things. And, and, and Aston is never the most powerful engine, never the most best braking, best handling car. It's about a balance of everything so that you retain some refinement, but it's also supposed to be classic, understated and the best looking car out on the marketplace. Aston have sort of changed their design style in over the years and their contemporary stuff isn't exactly classic and understated, but cars of this era sort of have those key Aston values. Yeah, I was about to say that, that you know, with, with Aston, it seems to be that they've, they've got the happy medium, you know, and, and they're, in that, they're in that perfect place, you know, then they're not too over the top with things like, like you said, you, when you sit in it, you don't, you're not gonna feel like you're in a bit of a tin can and if you crash it, it's gonna fall to pieces or anything like that, but, it just seems like it's a car you can sort of use for everyday use, but also you can have some fun in it and, and push it a little bit. Well, it's like this car. You, <clears throat> it's got all of those sports car pedigree ingredients to it. Engine power, carbon brakes, fairly lightweight. Uh, but then you've got the Italian flair designer looks to the outside. But when you sat in it, as, as you'll see when we get in it, there is um, some stitching patterns uh, that are bespoke to the Zagato. And um, when you're sat in it, you can feel those in your clothes. So sort of every time you sit and move in the seat, you're reminded that you're in a really special place and no Aston inside is like that. And then when you look through the rear view mirror, you can see the carbon wing. And then just the profile that you get as you look out the windscreen at the front wings, that whole package, everything all at the same time in this car just reminds you you're sat somewhere really special. I mean, the only problem for me, if I was ever to own one of these, I wouldn't be able to pull off the style in getting out of it and looking like a cool Italian dude <laughs> because I just haven't got that style. I'm a motorcycle racer and motorcycle racers don't seem to have that cool style. Mind you, apart from the Italian motorcycle racers, they seem to have it. Well, this sounds like a good cue to see if you've got it. Let's go for a drive in this car and see how you look like getting out of it. Well, I think I think we should do. We should do it a bit like a bit like a bomb movie, shouldn't we? Me getting out of it and just try, trying to look cool because I know I probably won't be able to look cool, but I'll try my best. Well, a bomb movie without the rolling in Casino Royale would uh, would make this owner very happy. Yeah, well, we do, we don't want to do any rolling, that's for sure.
know a lot in cars, you know your braking technique, because on bikes, when, you, when you're racing, your hardest brake point needs to be the first point of braking. So, and then like, you, you last, so you get on the brakes mega hard, so you stab the brakes, get on them hard, and then when you go into the corner, you start to release the brake. With a car, is it the same thing, or do you do you first start braking and then go heavier, or or what? Yeah, it's, it's the same. It's a hard stab. If you brake too early, and then you end up trail braking into the corner, you're just going to overheat the brakes, especially these carbon ceramic brakes. Right. Which is what a lot of inexperienced people end up doing. They go on track days find that they're totally overwhelmed by the braking performance of these brakes, yeah. brake too early, and then instead of correcting that the next time they're around that corner, yeah. they'll just trail brake, over, overheat the pad and disc assembly, and then fry a set of carbon ceramic brakes. But, you know, like with the RGs, you're, you're feeding the bike into a corner wearing a part on the tyre that might change between the race and it's all about getting the power down and getting it smooth uh, whereas cars you can just hustle them you, yeah, you yeah. can go into bends too fast scrub the speed off in the bend you know a good example of that is you know Gerrard's at Mallory where if you go into that corner too quick you've just got acres of space to scrub scrub off excess speed yeah which in a bike you'd have to be tippy toey about doing yeah. Whereas a car, you can just manhandle it around the bend. It's like that corner there. There was a bit of traction control intervention as we came out of that corner because I gave it too much gas too soon. Yeah. In the RG round here, you'd be petrified of doing that because that means you're off. Well, yeah, exactly. You got because you haven't got that traction control. Yeah, the thing is with bikes, like you've got, to, you've almost got to set your corner up before the corner. So you've got to get all your brake, not all your braking done, but you've got to get your hard braking done before you before you start tipping to the corner. You're still, in racing, you're still quite hard on the brake going in, but not as much as what you would be in the straight line. And then literally, as soon as you come off the brake, you need to be back on the gas, so you've not got that neutral phase in between. Because when you have that neutral phase in between, there's nothing going through the bike. And that's when you, the danger part is that you could crash because there's no force going through it. This V12 engine has got so much torque that we can pretty much leave it locked in one gear and do all of this circuit. Yeah. Obviously this is a tight little circuit and that wouldn't be the same at uh, a lot of full, full length race circuits. But that makes it really easy to start progressing speed and lap times. Yeah. Because you can just spend a while concentrating on your line so you've got your line right through every corner. Yeah, you don't have to, you haven't got other things to concentrate on. So then when you've spent a few laps getting your line right, without worrying about braking too much or gear changing, then you can start to speed it up a bit. And with the line right, get your braking point right, get your turn in point right. That was all the dynamic stability control of this car getting it around that bend. You can, you can feel it. You can feel the electronics just like kick in a bit and hold it back a bit. I wasn't smooth going around there. And really, if it didn't have the driver aids on, the car would have understeered quite a bit going into that corner. Yeah, you can feel it, can't you? It's a difficult one to get right, that, because you, you think if you have to slow down to the speed you should do to take it, you're actually going too slow. The other thing is with cars, well, 
not single seater cars like this car you've got a sign on to you you know with a bike it's just you on the thing so that's the other thing is you've got to consider you know especially for a left hand corner you've got to consider where you're sitting on the road well that was my conversation with you at the start about a different line because yeah. in a bike you're, you're going to be so used to positioning yourself on the track where you are as a rider but now you're on the right hand side of the car yeah the thing with that one is to uh, just feed the power in real late you feed the power in too soon and it just starts to get out of shape but that's the thing with these manual Astons if you're braking heavy coming into bends you have to heel and toe Right. If you don't do that and speed match engine and gearbox, then the whole drive line is going to have a snatch to it. Yeah. So to get turn in point right, braking point right, on and off the brakes right, and to do a heel and toe speed match gear shift all at the same time, that's one heck of a workload. Right, your turn. Whoa, oh, I think nervous. It's quite a strange perception because on the tarmac accelerating down there in the RG500 would actually be going quicker. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It doesn't feel quicker though. It's, but I don't know if it's because um, you're, quite, you're quite low down, isn't you? And I, I don't know if it's just because it's different. Oh, I felt the anti lock come on there. It's this section through here in a car you can just take far quicker than a bike. Yeah, you got far, you got a lot more downforce, isn't you? A lot more rubber on the ground. You're asking me about braking earlier. Yeah. You could have probably started braking 10 metres further down and absolutely hammered on the brakes and then come off real quick. Right. I'll, uh, I'll give it a go next time. It's just the, the confidence. I, I don't know, drove something is worth this much money. Yeah, so you hammered on the brakes there and a bit later, but it was still too early for the turn in point. Yeah. So later turn in, yeah. 
so you could have gone later on the brakes there. Yeah, later entry. I mean, I must admit, I'm feeling extremely weird at the moment. Are oh, you really? Because how can I give driving tip techniques on late braking to someone that does yeah, 180 know. mile an hour down Bray Hill? It, yeah. I can't get that through my head. It's just something completely different though, so I'm getting used to it. Wow, oh, that's better, I'm getting there. Those brakes are later. super sharp. They're flipping up. It's just having the confidence that it's going to stop, you know? Now, if there's one corner on this circuit you can get right before the end of today, it's that one. You can just have the confidence in the brakes to brake super late, hard on the pedal, and then time it right so you're turning in. At that point, you're coming off the brake pedal. Yeah, nice and smooth round the corner where I was a bit too rough, a bit too fast round the corner. Got a la uh, got to go real deep, haven't you, into the corner, yeah? You know? Almost got to go past it. Exit so you don't use to try not to use the traction control so you get a better drive. in the Aston round the track then. I loved it, I loved it. Like round the right, left, right, into the right, you could feel the rear just coming round a little bit, but that kind of put you on the good line for the left sort of thing. And obviously with the RG, it's cold and with the tires and stuff like that, it was a bit more sketchier. But yeah, with the car, you can kind of, in the right, you could get the rear round a little bit to set it up for the left, which was really good. But again, I. I'd love a bit more time in one just to get a bit more confident and just to experiment. But like we were saying before, with a speed perception of racing motorbikes, that comes in handy. You know, when you're in control, when you've got hold of the steering wheel, when you've got hold of the handlebars, when you're in control, the speed perception does slow down a bit because your brain's already up to speed. But I should think any normal person, if they got in with us, I think they'd be a bit scared. What about the V12 engine? What do you think its pull out of the corners was like? You know, this V12 engine has got phenomenal torque. What did that feel like to put the power on when you're coming out of the corners? It had a wide range of, of power, you know. Maybe if you're racing, I would have gone for a corner in the gear lower to get it out the corner quicker, but you can get it through in the gear taller. So it, it helped me a lot just to concentrate on how hard I can brake and the cornering technique without having to think about changing gear. So. The car done me a lot of favours today for sure. So we've actually used the supercar as a car to be pushed around the track uh, and it's soaked that up really well. So what do you think about taking it out on the road? Can I take it down to the south of France with me and my missus? I think she'd be quite impressed with that. Well, I don't know about the south of France, but we've certainly got some decent driver's roads around us in Warwickshire. So let's reconvene with this car on the road. And until it gets dusk, I think we'll just step back and look at this beautiful car in this light. It doesn't matter what angle you look at it from, it is just gorgeous. To find out more about Petrol Revolt, then please head across to our website petrolrevolt.com